this is one of the most deadly killers of the sea, the dreaded tiger shark. We're going to find out more about this dangerous creature, and we'll see some sea monsters that are actually quite harmless today when Discovery takes a first-hand look at Monsters of the Ocean Deep. Discovery 67, the award-winning program for young people, with Bill Owen. Fun in the sun and prizes, too. Well, that's what we deliver every weekday right here on Treasure Isle, TV's only outdoor game show. Oh, hello, I'm John Bartholomew Tucker, the only host on TV with sand in his shoes. I kind of think you'll get a kick out of watching our contestants get soaked and sunburned on their way to digging up real buried treasure as they battle across our uh, not-so-sleepy lagoon. Oh, look out there, young lady. Whoops, there goes a girl overboard. Ah, but it's really worth it when they finally reach Treasure Isle in triumph. Uh-oh, there goes everybody overboard, because that's where they get a chance to unearth such prizes as cars, boats, jewels, color TV sets, freezers, treasures uh, enough to make even Blackbeard jealous. And you at home can win, too. So join us, won't you? Spend a Florida vacation every day on Treasure Isle. Hi. Welcome to Discovery. These men are bringing in a sand shark that's just been captured alive so that scientists can study it firsthand and learn more about its behavior. The more we learn, the easier it is to separate fact from fiction about these and other monsters of the ocean. The shark, the ray, and the octopus have all inspired tales of horror. But there are two kinds of sea monsters, real and imaginary. Some of the fictional stories have led us to believe that any giant creature swimming in the ocean must be a horrifying monster. But size and strange appearance do not necessarily mean they are dangerous to man. Among the very real living creatures we'll see today, we'll find that some of the largest and strangest ones are actually quite harmless. But that description does not fit the shark. It is definitely one of the living sea monsters that are harmful to man. As you can see, they're handling it very carefully because a shark of this size can be extremely dangerous. Sharks are immune to pain and very difficult to kill. There are sharks that never grow larger than one foot in length. And there are man-eaters like the great white shark that grow to be 40 feet long. The largest of all, the whale shark, is harmless to man. It feeds only on tiny plankton, but it can reach 60 feet in length and weigh over 15 tons. Sharks are among the oldest inhabitants of the sea. In over 300 million years, their basic body structure has hardly changed at all because it's so perfectly designed for its purpose, to hunt food. Unlike other fish, almost all shark babies are born alive, ready to start swimming and eating. In some cases, a mother shark will even attack her own young. The youngsters learn to look out for themselves at a very early age. Most fish have air bladders in their bodies to help keep them afloat, but sharks do not. So the shark must keep swimming as long as it lives, or it will sink to the bottom. Instead of scales, the shark's skin is covered with thousands of tiny razor-sharp denticles make its hide tougher than sandpaper. Underneath its snout, the crescent-shaped mouth is filled with longer versions of these denticles, the wicked teeth. There are several rows for piercing, shearing, and grinding. And each time a set of teeth wears out or falls out, a new row grows forward to replace it. Its front fins are fixed and quite stiff. Just like the veins on a submarine, they're used mainly for steering. The shark cannot stop short or back up. That's why it attacks in swerving lunges and keeps circling its prey. 
All of its driving forward strength comes from the powerful tail. The shark's sense organs are also specialized for hunting. For a long time, it was thought that sharks had very poor eyesight and were colorblind. Recent scientific research, however, has proved that sharks can distinguish certain colors and that their eyes are specially adapted to work better in darkness. Their sense of smell is highly developed and so delicate that a shark can often be seen weaving from side to side, zeroing in on the exact source of the food smell. Not all sharks are man-eaters. Out of approximately 250 species of sharks, only about a dozen are definitely dangerous to man. One of the most dangerous is the mako shark. A full-grown mako can measure 12 feet in length and weigh over a thousand pounds. Its blue-gray color blends in with the water and its white belly makes it difficult to see from below. The mako's snout is long and pointed and the teeth are spiky and irregular. The mako is a fast swimmer that usually feeds on mackerel, chasing and eating whole schools of them, but it will also attack larger fish and people. It's even been known to strike at small boats. Makos are world travelers. They're found from New England to Florida, as far south as the Cape of Good Hope in Africa and among the islands of the Pacific. One of the most aggressive sharks is the hammerhead. It's easy to recognize because of its flattened hammer-like head. Its eyes and nostrils are located at the sides of the head. No one really knows why they've developed such an unusual shape. The best guess is that the hammer serves as a stabilizer or a rudder at the front end to help it swim. Hammerheads are found in warm waters all over the world, and they can be very dangerous to man because they often swim around ships and docks. They'll grab at anything that falls into the water, food scraps, paper, life preservers, even metal cans have been found inside hammerhead stomachs. This is a sample of shark's skin. It's so tough that it will dull even the sharpest knife. This hide is so rough that years ago, before sandpaper was invented, carpenters would use it for sanding down wood. Medieval knights also used it on the handles of their swords because it made a perfect non-slipping grip. How are dangerous specimens like these caught and kept alive? We'll go along on a shark hunting trip aboard a collecting boat to watch shark hunters in action in just a minute. A pinch of chicken giggle, please. Chicken giggle? With a wart on it. red-eyed, no-nosed, nothing. Cracker Jack, from an ancient family recipe. We're on board the special boat used by Marineland of Florida to catch and keep alive large creatures of the sea. The ordinary methods using nets or seines aren't any good where sharks are concerned. Their tough hides and sharp teeth will cut through almost any kind of net. Instead, they use a very simple technique to catch sharks, a hook and line. This is one of the oldest known fishing methods. It's called long lining. Each one of these large hooks is attached to a length of chain. A whole fish is baited onto each hook. And the chains are attached every few feet to a heavy long line. The line is carefully let out over the side and attached to a floating buoy. After enough time has elapsed, the buoy is recovered and the line is pulled up. There are plenty of hungry sharks down there, all right. 
This one is an excellent specimen, and it's still full of fight. It's quite a job, and the men are guiding it carefully, trying to get the shark into position so it can be slipped into the open well inside the boat. Finally, it goes inside. The hook is removed from its mouth. And because it's still a dangerous creature to handle, they spray an anesthetic inside the shark's mouth. The effects of the anesthetic will wear off, but it helps keep the shark quiet while the boat returns to shore. Here, the shark is placed in a sling and lifted onto shore. The crew carries the shark very carefully into the pool where it will be kept alive. This diver has an unusual job. He's a shark walker. As the anesthetic wears off, the diver helps the shark begin to swim by taking water in through its mouth and out through its gills. It's weak enough so that the diver can pick it up and splash it around. Now the shark is able to swim away by itself. Soon it's fully recovered, swimming around with the other sea creatures in this giant observation tank. Another sea creature that's dangerous to man is the stingray. If you live near the ocean, you've probably seen the ray's smaller cousins called skates. But some rays do reach gigantic size. Rays and sharks are closely related. Like the sharks, rays have no bones in their bodies. But their bodies are flattened out, a perfect adaptation for living on the ocean bottom. Stingrays do not actually attack human beings. Most injuries are caused by swimmers accidentally touching or stepping on the hidden body of the ray as it lies buried in the shallow sand. To defend itself, the ray whips up its tail and uses its barbed stinger to jab at whatever has touched it. This stinger has been removed from the stingray's tail. It's covered with tiny hooks that can penetrate the skin. Some species carry a venomous poison in their stingers that can be painful and even fatal. Like the sharks, baby rays are born alive. These babies were born just a few minutes ago. And nature has protected the mother stingray from injury by covering the baby stinger with a layer of skin that wears off soon after the baby's born. The brown color on top and white underneath make a perfect camouflage for the stingray. Its wing-like fins give it the appearance of a bird. When it swims, it's one of the most graceful looking creatures of the sea. Because it spends most of its life on the bottom, its eyes are on top, so it can look up and ahead. Its breathing holes are called spiracles. They're also on top, where the ray draws in water. It expels the water underneath through its gills. The spotted leopard ray is a larger and more powerful relative of the stingray. Its coloring blends in with the mottled weed and sea plants in which it lives. It has an unusually sharp nose, like a bird's beak. Like the stingray, it feeds on crabs and other bottom fish. The rays generally move slowly as they cruise over the bottom, but they're capable of great bursts of speed. Watch this one. The one ray that truly achieves monster size is one that is not at all harmful to man, the manta ray. It's sometimes called the devil fish, but it doesn't really deserve that name. Although the giant manta grows to a width of more than 20 feet from wingtip to wingtip and weighs more than 3,500 pounds, it feeds only on microscopic plankton. In fact, it seems that the very largest sea monsters, like the whale shark, the blue whale, and the manta, all feed on the tiniest creatures in the sea and are harmless to man. The manta ray takes in water through its huge mouth, straining the plankton through bony plates in its throat. The two horns on the front of its mouth, which help it scoop up the plankton, are probably why it came to be called a devil fish. This pair of jaws belongs to a beautiful but deadly killer of the sea, the barracuda. Like the shark, the barracuda is well equipped for its purpose. It has separate sets of teeth, fangs for spearing, and other teeth for shearing its food. The barracuda can be called one of the ocean's monsters, not only because it's been known to attack people, but because of its size as well. This species, the great barracuda, can grow to be over 12 feet long. 
It's called the Tiger of the Sea for good reasons. The huge eyes give it excellent vision, and it will attack almost any brightly colored or moving object underwater. Unlike a shark, the barracuda will hover and watch its prey like a cat, slowly moving in as it stalks. Then it makes one single swift attack, like a silver torpedo. Like all animals, the barracuda must eat in order to live. And even a baby barracuda, only three inches long, is born with a fine hunting instinct. It'll wait patiently. Anything that moves will attract its attention. It makes no sign except for the slight twitching of its fins as it stalks its prey. And when it's finally ready, it attacks in a flash. The young hunter carefully juggles its catch to get it into swallowing position. These baby barracuda prefer to swallow their meal tail first instead of head first, as most fish do. It takes skillful handling, but it finally gets its dinner down. In a year or so, the barracuda grows to a length of two or three feet. At this age, they hunt in packs, as many as a hundred or more suddenly appearing out of the blue depths. They live, cruise, and hunt together until they reach maturity. When they reach four to six feet long, they seem to prefer to live alone. They leave the pack to roam the ocean in solitary majesty. The safest rule to remember where any sharks or barracudas are concerned is never to swim alone or when the water is cloudy or at night. We're going to see more monsters of the deep and we'll find out about one that's supposed to be the most frightening of all, but is actually a very shy creature, the octopus. And we'll do that in just a minute. Never met me, is that what you're trying to say? You said it, I didn't. If the course of true love in Bewitch sometimes goes berserk, could it be due to outside interference? Like way outside? Go back to your friendly bartender with your mouth full of olives. <laughs> I have been absolutely powerless all day. I've been trying to get the piano to play and the fire to burn and the lighter to light. I mean it, Sam. There are times I wish I never met you. Of course, there are other times I realize that I couldn't live without you, and I have to admit that's most of the time. Follow the continuing comedy of witchcraft versus mortal patience on Bewitched, in color on ABC. The octopus has been the subject of more monster stories than any other sea creature. Actually, it's not an evil villain at all. Basically, the octopus is very shy and retiring, one of the most intelligent creatures in the sea, and usually quite eager to get out of man's way. There is a relative of the octopus that could be considered a monster of the deep, a giant squid with a long tapered body and an extra pair of arms that can grow to be over 50 feet long. These giant squid are big enough to attack enormous sperm whales, whose bodies sometimes show huge round sucker marks. 
And there are historical records of small boats that have been grasped by the tentacles of giant squid. The smaller relative of the squid, the octopus, only grows to about 30 feet. In fact, some species of octopus are just an inch wide, fully grown. The octopus doesn't really deserve its bad reputation. It is a fascinating creature, though. Actually, it belongs to the mollusk family, related to clams, oysters, and snails. But long ago, the octopus learned to get along without its shell, trading it for the ability to get around quickly. The name octopus comes from the Greek word meaning eight-armed. And those eight arms, or tentacles, are very useful indeed. They're strong, powerful tools for grasping and holding, lined with two rows of suckers, just like suction cups. Normally, the octopus moves around on the bottom by crawling, using the tentacles like legs. But when it has to move fast, it uses jet propulsion. It takes water in through its gills, and then expels it very sharply through this tube. Now it has a much different streamlined shape as these jet blasts of water drive it forward at great speed with its tentacles trailing behind. The octopus usually prefers to make its home in dark caves or holes in rocks and coral. It can see quite well in the darkness because of its excellent eyesight. Its large eyes are among the most highly developed of any sea creatures. The octopus can actually see better than a man does. This Atlantic octopus is about five feet across, and its favorite food is a blue crab, like these two. One of them makes a mistake. It goes hunting inside the octopus's cave, and the octopus is ready and waiting. It knows how to deal with the crab's sharp claws. It pins them with the suction discs, and it also produces a paralyzing anesthetic that quickly ends the crab's struggles as the octopus settles down to a well-earned dinner. The octopus does have a mouth, but it's hidden on the underside of its head. Covering the mouth, it has a sharp, horny beak, just like a bird's beak, that it uses to rip its food apart before swallowing it. The octopus is well equipped for its special way of life. Although it doesn't have many natural enemies, one of them is the deadly moray eel. The moray eel is one sea monster that does deserve the name. It has a vicious set of teeth that curve inward. Once a moray gets a grip on a victim, it won't let go. It hides in caves and crevices, and if it's disturbed, it will attack human beings. Some moray eels can grow to 10 feet in length. This one is about six feet long and quite dangerous. But the octopus has some unusual defense weapons that it can use. One of them is the ability to change its color very suddenly, the way it has changed here from dark to light, to almost blend in with the background. But the moray knows it's there, somewhere. Squeezed into the cave, the octopus shields its soft body with its leathery tentacles. The moray watches for an opening, then it strikes. The octopus has another weapon, a cloud of dark ink that it releases like a smoke screen. It also dulls the sense organs of the moray eel, and it works. The eel is stunned and confused by the ink. The octopus, although badly bitten, is still alive, and it manages to escape safely. Large and small, fierce and harmless, there are all sorts of monsters in the sea. It just depends on how you look at them. We'll find out about more creatures of the deep in just a minute. It's Saturday afternoon at the movies. How long will that chocolatey Tootsie Roll last? Let's watch. It's lasting through the chase scene. Well, it's lasting through the love scene. It's even lasting through the rescue scene. Yes, bar candy disappears in a few bites. And bag candy disappears in a few gulps. But when other candies are all gone, chewy, chewy Tootsie Roll goes on and on. A long time, long time, 
Chewy, chewy, tootsie roll lasts a long time, lasts a long time. Get some. That girl has really got it. I got it. You got it? <laughs> and why not? She's so captivating, so provocative. Warm, sympathetic, so tender. Don't ever bother me again, because if you do, I'm going to turn your name over to the New York Police Department, the Bureau of Immigration, the FBI, and the CRO. C-I-E. C-O-L. C-I-A. She's so uh, eager, uh, industrious. Ah, but that face. Well, one thing for sure, Marlo Thomas will make you fall for Fat Girl, in color on ABC. As we've seen today, some of the monsters in the ocean are very real and very dangerous. And some aren't dangerous at all. But there's still some unexplainable sea monsters. Since the early days of sailing ships, many reliable witnesses have reported unknown creatures, like the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. And in Gloucester, Massachusetts in 1817, some sort of giant sea snake was seen in the harbor on several occasions by over 300 people. Many of these reports describe a creature similar to a prehistoric relative of the dinosaurs that became extinct millions of years ago. But in 1938, a strange fish called a coelacanth was discovered alive off the coast of South Africa. This living fossil was also supposed to have disappeared from the Earth 250 million years ago. Perhaps there are sea monsters still undiscovered somewhere in the depths of the ocean. If you'd like to learn more about monsters of the ocean deep, here are some books to ask for at your library. Sharks by Herbert S. Zim. Sea Monsters by William Knowlton. And this book, The Phantom World of the Octopus and Squid by Joseph J. Cook and William L. Wisner. Be sure to join us next week for another exciting discovery program. Bye-bye. The Discovery Unit's transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs.